welcome to my house. <laughs> We're not in your house. No, We're in his a, vineyard. No, it's not a vineyard. If this is your house, you need a new roof. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Welcome to the 13th episode of Season 3 of the Ubuntu UK Podcast. It's Monday, the 2nd of August, 2010. And in this episode, we're going to talk about planets and tablets. We will, of course, cover the latest news and events. There's some command line love. There's more bit about Ubuntu. And we'll go over your feedback. I'm Alan, and with me this week is Tony. Hello. Hello, how are you? I'm okay, thank you. What have you been up to? Um, I've been eBaying more stuff. I think I was eBaying things last time. Well, yes. It's getting you obsessive. clearly have lots of stuff. Not or so you much had fail, failed auctions? No, no. I don't think anything has actually failed to sell. Um, so everything's everything's ticking over, which is good. And there's lots more free space in the house, which is just as good as well. Um, I went on a photo walk last weekend. What does that mean? Uh, it means you walk around with a group of other photographers and take things. The same picture. They take the same picture as each other. <laughs> no, no. You, you try to find something a bit different for everybody else. But there was about 25 of us. There was a worldwide photo walk day. And I went on the one in Southampton, and there were quite a few uh, um, geeks there, as they seem to like their digital cameras. And um, yeah, it was great. It was quite interesting. How do they organise the route? Uh, there's usually just uh, a leader who says, we're going to go and do this route. So he had a, about a two-hour walk sketched out. Well, two hours is very slow because you stop and you take a photograph, so it wasn't like miles. Right. Um, probably only I don't know, a couple of miles or something. What are you going to do with those photos? You can put them up on Flickr. There's a Flickr group, um, but there, there's a competition basically. So you can put them forward for your walk, and the best person from your walk gets nominated to go. I think nationally, and then the best ones nationally win a prize, and then there's a global prize. I don't think I'm going to win any really? prizes, not not sort of nationally or globally. Ah, but you know, um, good fun anyway. It was it was an interesting experience. Anyway. Did you spend most of the time comparing lenses with other people? There's a little bit of geekiness. Mine's bigger than yours, that sort of thing. Right. Um, and it was the first one I've been on, so I wasn't sure what to expect. But there wasn't as much collaboration as I thought there might be. I thought people might kind of help you each other out. You thought people come out, come and have a look at this, or no, yeah. you've got your lens set up wrong. Or. Well, that's it. I mean, if if there are people who you know are experts there, you might you might sort of they might say, well, why don't you try this, that, or the other, or what is it you're trying to achieve here? And you is might it be the able competition to... that stops that, or the fact that you don't know anyone. I don't think anybody was really taking the competition all that seriously, but I think. Yeah, maybe not knowing you know, who who is a good person to listen to and who <laughs> might not be quite so. A bit good like to a lug meeting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, fair enough though. But yeah, that's me. Cool. And Laura. Hello. Hello. What have you been up to? I was a book in you the were, human you library. You went to Womad, didn't you? I did. How um, was that? It was really interesting. Did the weather hold out all right? Yeah, it was lovely. Yeah, to get many people checking you out. As yep. it were, <laughs> in the nicest possible way. I had six clients. <laughs> <laughs> Golly! <laughs> um, it was right. slightly odd feeling actually. So being each one was forty-five out. minutes long. Just to remind anyone who hasn't heard. Okay, yeah, it was about half an hour each, um, and the idea was, I was a book about being a girl IT geek was my title, mm-hmm. and I'd written a blurb beforehand with like stereotypes of girl IT geeks, but actually mostly people were interested in the sort of IT geek part of it. So yeah. about six people borrowed me, and uh, I just sat on sat Did in the corner of the afterwards? tent. They put me back okay. afterwards. There was a bell ringing every half hour to make sure we right. got put back on the shelf. Did they put you on the right shelf? <laughs> Did it mix you up with, <laughs> you know, graphic <laughs> novels of some kind? Well, you, say, you say that. There oh, was what? actually a row of chairs that was the bookshelf, and we had to sit there in between borrows because you kept finding books would drift off somewhere <laughs> and they couldn't find them when somebody came to borrow them they didn't print your Dewey number on your spine no they? but I did have a little thing around my neck saying I'm a book <laughs> yes <laughs> and were people genuinely interested in stuff and asking well, you questions or that was it because you started off each time and it was slightly not nerve wracking or anything it was just a little bit kind of I've got half an hour now to talk to somebody I've never met before what if they can't think of anything they want to ask me? How right. am I going to talk to them? But they chose to take you mm. out. They told, yeah, but they'd sometimes been set up by their friends to right. borrow a book or something. And I, <laughs> she do. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I thought pretty much you could go through things that I'm interested in and have tweeted and blogged about, and I covered mo- all of them pretty much during so the day. So did you have a little card, a little reference card <clears> of stuff for you to remember? No, I mean, one well. guy was asking about... Um, uh, technology versus values and things. So we kind of got onto environmental resources and stuff, and how technology uses them, but also can be good for the world. Like and were many of the people technical themselves? 
No, um, some a couple I talked to about Flickr and Facebook and uses of it and usability and that sort of thing. Um, and other people were interested in sort of, we talked about the energy monitoring stuff. Mm-hmm. And, um, some of them wanted to define geek. So we had a, sort of two or three conversations about what a geek is and um, they're sort of giving examples of things that I do, such as the open sourcey type stuff outside of work and about my Arduino project, which there was a group of gap year lads came around and they were like, that is geeky, but it's very cool. <laughs> <laughs> a nice bit of validation there yeah. from random people. <laughs> what about so you then? Um, I, uh, what have I done? Oh, Tomboy. Um, I've used Tomboy for my notes. Okay. And um, I've, I had problems in the early days with syncing my notes up with Ubuntu 1. And right. it was either unreliable or failed or, you know, for whatever yeah. reason, I don't know where, where the problem was. So I decided to switch and I started using Dropbox to synchronize my notes. <laughs> okay. So what I did was I pointed my Tomboy at my Dropbox folder and figured this was a great idea. So I can save all my notes and they get synchronized into Dropbox. Uh. And then that gets automatically synchronized up to the cloud and then down to every other machine, okay. which all point their Tomboy at Dropbox. But. Sounds There's a, a fundamental flaw in this, in that if two of the machines were switched on, and they both happen to have a window open, a Tomboy window open, right. Tomboy stores the X and Y coordinates on the screen <gasps> in the note. So if I leave a machine on at home with a note in the middle of the screen, which is perfectly plausible to do, and then I go to work, and I open that same note at work, it the machine at work writes a new X and Y coordinate on the screen when I move it, and the mm. two machines then conflict and sit there synchronizing all day through Dropbox, right? So this is nothing wrong with Tomboy, right. nothing wrong with Ubuntu One. It's my own stupid idea of the way I synchronize my notes. The result of this was I had some notes mm. that had weird, weird file names. Like they, they have weird file names, like UUID file names. But it had the word um, host names conflicted copy in brackets, right? Right. And Tomboy was fine opening these notes that that were conflicted because of Dropbox conflicts. But then I switched back to using Ubuntu 1 and I discovered that Ubuntu 1 doesn't like these random brackets and excellent and, right. and apostrophes in the file names. So I ended up having to get the the Ubuntu 1 guys to manually delete my <laughs> Oops. Um, notes off the server. It was quite painful. So how do you sync up with Ubuntu 1? What, my notes? Yeah. It's actually really easy. Because I had a look in Tomboy and I couldn't see anything. You go um, in preferences, yeah. there's a tab for synchronization. Synchronizing. Synchronization. And you choose web. Yeah. And it, it's got the field pre filled in. Oh, right. I expected it to say sync with Ubuntu One now. Yeah, actually, it, it's like one.ubuntu.com okay. slash notes. And you just press the button and it opens up a browser, which is a bit clunky, and gets you to, to validate your Launchpad account. And that's it. And it works on Windows, Mac, and Linux. This is cool. the same process in Tomboy. And it, it works really, really well. So now I've I, I deleted all my notes and started all over again. So I've got brand new notes and everything syncs perfectly and I'm very happy with Ubuntu <laughs> One notes <laughs> sync. So my top tip is don't synchronize your notes through Dropbox. Or if you do have access to the Ubuntu One development team yes. and get them to do <laughs> and your the funky script they use to delete stuff. Yeah. Hmm. Um, well, there's no Dave and no Simon in this episode. So I asked our great um, unwashed followers um, what they were, what they were doing, what they've been doing the last week or so. Oh, right. And um, said charming things to them as well. Yeah. Ross McLean says he's brought, brought, just brought a joggler and uh, was listening to the last episode. And he's going to get a big old USB stick on and stuck that in as extra storage. Cool. Uh, Harry Myher, that's a Twitter name, um, has been playing with Windows Mobile. And uh, Alan Lord has been moving his business accounting system from GNU Cash to Open ERP. So far, so good. Wow. Mm. Nice. So there you go. That's what some of the people have been doing. Should we start the show? Let's. There's been a bit of chatter this week about Planets, the blog aggregation services, um, on two fronts. One is about internationalization and languages, and one is about the content of the blog posts and stuff that is included on such planets as planet.ubuntu.com and the various loco planets and any other planet. Um, now, what's the noise been about in more detail, Alan? There's a, there's a few things, really. So this one is mm-hmm. um, stuff has appeared on the planet that possibly people weren't expecting and didn't like. Okay. So unwanted content. That's never happened before. <laughs> what, what sort of unwanted content are well, we talking about? Well, it was a it was a bit of a 
strange one in that Dell are a corporate blog which mm-hmm. is approved to be on Planet Ubuntu. Okay. And some stuff leaked onto their feed about <laughs> completely non Linuxy, non Ubuntu stuff. Right, okay. And so some people didn't like the idea that Dell were putting basically marketing stuff on right. the Ubuntu Planet. Okay. So that's one example. Yep. But I suppose you could stretch that to people putting stuff about totally unrelated subjects as individuals. Like the trip to planets. the zoo. Like Severed Fifth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, kind of, but it's a bit different for individuals, isn't it? Because the the whole idea of planet or at least the way yeah. i understand it it's a window on the world of ubuntu users and developers and well, so it's planet a, ubuntu yeah, yeah for that particular yeah. planet so it's about you know pulling in information from their blogs about whatever they do yeah o- okay we ask that they tag their stuff ubuntu so that we don't get every single post on planet ubuntu only the stuff that's ubuntu related cuz it'll be a big planet or it's, it? it's not so much of a window on the world then really is it it's only a smaller window, maybe a fan light on the world. <laughs> well, yeah, but maybe maybe if people are just thoughtful about what they tag a bunch yeah. of, it might well be that you know someone like Jono posts and tags Severed Fifth stuff with Ubuntu. Yeah, because he knows people in the Ubuntu community are interested in open um, culture, culture, music, music yeah. and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay, it's not directly not. related to Ubuntu, but it's something people like that might be interested in. Yeah. Okay. You see what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, um, and there were a couple more. One was um, something was posted uh, in uh, Hebrew on the right. Planet. Okay, so that's interesting for a couple of reasons. One, it was non-English, mm. and actually the poster put if you want to see it in English, click here, and it will go through okay. to his blog. And it's you know you can press a button, or if you're using Google Chrome, it offers to translate mm. it anyway. So if you're interested in reading it, you can translate it. So were people actually objecting to the fact that there was a blog post in Hebrew? Well, in non, you know, in a non English. non English. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. People left comments on the guy's blog saying, "Why have you posted this to Planet Ubuntu?" Yeah. And their point was, well, uh, it was non English, so yeah. I can't read it. <laughs> therefore, it shouldn't exist. And I don't use Google Chrome. Therefore, uh, you know, uh, how dare you? Right. Linux for human beings. Is that beings. not a little <laughs> yeah, human beings who speak English? <laughs> <laughs> Is that not a little narrow sighted? I mean. Th- We've said in the last episode we talked about uh, internationalisation and and the different cultures that get involved in a free software project like Ubuntu. You to might it. learn something. Well, I mean, okay, you're probably not going to learn something if 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 there's a blog post in Hebrew in Hebrew and you don't speak Hebrew, you might not learn something from Even that. Even if you blog hit post. the translate button, if you hit the translate button, you may well do. Yeah. But at, at the worst, it's something in your feed reader or that you look on your web web browser and you scroll past it. Yeah, oh, that's one entry. Yeah. There's, there's hundreds of entries. So what if what if um, uh, lots of people posted in their native language? So it's not just one entry in Hebrew. There was a few. Then what if there was a bunch yeah. of Spanish, French, German, Hebrew, Kanji, you know, and interspersed. There was the odd one in English, or some in English. I don't know what yeah. the proportion would be, but there would probably be some in English. So what if Planet Ubuntu was just any language goes? I guess you do reach a point where the signal to noise ratio and i'm not foreign I, languages are noise now no, no, no. In, in terms of what you can understand and what you can't usefully use yeah as a person who maybe only speaks one language whatever that language may be mm. um, i guess there's a point where it becomes less useful for so you to the usefulness to subscribing to that for feed. everyone goes down possibly yeah not just the English speakers, the usefulness yeah, for... Absolutely, Well, if yeah. there's that many different languages, I guess everybody's got in the same boat, aren't they? Mm. But, I don't know. Yeah, I think you still learn something by being sort of surrounded by lots of languages. Mm. And it kind of reminds you that you're not just... It's not just English. Mm. I mean, All right, you probably yeah. learn that lesson quite quickly once it starts. <laughs> but, you know, I think it's good for people. Well, if, the, if the planet was... Um, uh, written in such a way that when you're looking at the posts, if you're looking directly at planetubuntu.com, if they had a little translate button next to them, mm. you know, that could, or or it could dynamically translate everything to English for you, then would language. that be, that would be nicer, or yeah, or whatever your language of your locale of your machine is. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a role for loco planets, isn't there? 
to do that sort of thing, perhaps? Well, yeah. I mean, so, locos do have some locos. I don't know all of them, but I know some locos yeah. have their own. I mean, the UK language, has one, yeah. which obviously is in English, but contains posts from... Because one of the criteria for being on Planet Ubuntu is being an Ubuntu member or a developer or right. s- some, other, some other way you've got your Ubuntu membership or a corporate blog like Dell. Yeah, or a podcast. <laughs> or uh, yeah, well, well no, any anything any like uh, Myth TV has their syndicated on Planet One Two. Right, okay. Screencast team does. We do the podcast yeah. does. So, but the proviso has always been the person or people who control that feed should be Ubuntu members, in right. theory. Okay. Now, technically, it's possible for you, Tony, who's not an Ubuntu member, to put a post in our feed yeah. and it appear on Planet Ubuntu. Yeah. But. We kind of accept that, you know, we have Splitting some level of trust and, and respect that we wouldn't do that. Yeah. And or it, if you did do that, you wouldn't put something outrageous on there. No. So, I mean, I've, I've released an episode of the show. Oh, yeah. When you were on holiday, holiday last yeah. year. Yeah, and, you know, so, so technically that was me doing that. But yeah. I, I'm a very responsible individual. So is there a kind of understanding that... Um, Don't laugh. <laughs> ...that the kind of official language is of English? Yeah, it actually says that on the guidelines. Okay. There's a There's a wiki page. Which, for membership or for the f- Specifically for the planet that details what we think is the right thing that should be on the planet. You know, mm. basically, our That's recommendation suitable. is English language and it should be Ubuntu related. But, um, you know, basically, it's, it's you know, don't be a jackass. Don't, don't annoy people. Yeah. But that's very hard to do in a global, you know, community of people who have different political persuasions, different cultures. You know, it's not hard to annoy someone somewhere. Well, that feeds really nicely into the the idea of the sort of content you should put up on on uh, a, a large aggregation site, something like Planet Ubuntu. Um, okay, heavy metal music isn't that offensive to to a lot of people, but there will be people who object. I am outraged. <laughs> there will be people Tony's who, a fan. who object to that sort of thing. Just as on um, Planet Hanslug, there is a, a guy, he's a member of the Lug, who is um, a, a vicar, and he posts um, not not deeply religious posts but he talks about his work in as a chaplain and things Mm -hmm. like that um and there have been people who say oh what's that doing on the planet and things and i think it's a really interesting um really interesting blog post and he's a really good writer so i enjoy uh, you know the color of of his posts um but yet for some people it's it's an objectionable content to have on there and there are there are other um posts that uh, there are other um I've just remembered another category that is also allowed on Planet Ubuntu, which is um, certain other groups that are deemed okay by the Community Council. And right. one of those is the Canonical Design Team. Okay. So the, the design team were criticised in the last release, or the one before, I can't remember, about the whole button-moving thing and a lack of communication. So as part of resolving that, they said, okay, let's set up a blog for the design right. guys and girls uh, yeah. and you know, get the information out there. And wouldn't it be a good idea to put that on Planet Ubuntu? Mm. Now, some people are going to say, well, that's the design team for a commercial organisation. Yeah. Okay, they're the sponsor of the Ubuntu project, but it's a commercial entity. Could we have like Red Hat on there? Could we have you know, other commercial yeah. entities on there? Well, if they're going to have Dell on there, it seems a bit odd not to allow Canonical. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it's also been requested that we put the marketing department blog on there right now but only posts that are specifically tagged Ubuntu so that could be something like you know this Ubuntu in business event yeah it'd be mm. promoting events like that where Canonical want to work with the community right. to promote Ubuntu okay it's a marketing exercise for Canonical because there's the potential for them to you know get business out of it but equally mm. you know it helps the community as well one of the things about Planet Ubuntu is that it's so big, there are so many people on there, and it wouldn't take a lot of deviation from a current set of rules to to have a lot of noise and have a lot of, um, perhaps make it a lot less useful for people. A lot less useful for people. How but, do you define useful? What's useful well, about Planet Ubuntu? How long you've got to spend well, we reading get half it every of our day? Content from it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. God planet. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. People read it every day, and they obviously get value from reading those posts. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas, it could quite easily tip over if you don't have any rules and regulations, or at least guidelines, perhaps, in into you know something that people no longer value as much and don't read as much. Mm. And it's one of it seems to be one of the central things for the Ubuntu community is the planet. People really do sort of. If you've got your if something is announced on the planet, it's as good. It's announced, you know. And we we know from from our sort of stats and stuff how much traffic comes to us from planet ubuntu 
I don't yeah. know when and if you if you blog about something, yeah. you can see your stats go rocket yeah. up this, as soon as it's syndicated on Planet Ubuntu. Yeah, you know, you get you know, your blog post gets syndicated on there and you'll get tons of comments from it being syndicated on, on Planet Ubuntu. So it really is a core part of the communication of the community, I think. Yeah. And to sort of risk devaluing that somehow um, or making it less effective a communication tool is it, quite a high risk strategy because I'm not sure what would replace it for all the fact that planets and blogs seem quite an old-fashioned way of doing things now. And is, it, is it, in fact, the right place for us to be communicating things? Is it right that, that Jono announces on his blog when the next developer summit is? I know he's the community manager, but is it right that it should be on his blog? Shouldn't it be either uh, announced on uh, a news site, like yeah. The Fridge, which is supposedly where yeah. we're supposed to announce news? Should, should we be getting our... You know, we, we've we've got this culture in Ubuntu that that if it it like you say, if it appears on Planet Ubuntu, mm. it kind of doesn't matter who announced it. If it appears on Planet Ubuntu, that's gospel. That's the truth. <laughs> yeah, that's dangerous. <laughs> and is that right? And also, there's quite a lot of pressure then to keep up with that. If you go away for a holiday for a week or so, and you and you miss those blog posts, and you miss the announcement of something, yeah, where do well, how do you catch up? How do you find out what you missed? Do you need to? Well, yeah. Um, use a decent RSS reader. <laughs> well, yeah. Okay. But th- I don't use one at all now. <laughs> really? Do you just visit the site on its own? Don't no, I only ever go to websites if they're linked on Twitter. <laughs> if somebody, if, some, if somebody, if somebody, you're fun, kidding me. Yeah. If somebody blogs something and they post a link to it on Twitter, or if somebody just links to another post, or there's a link from somewhere else, um, then yeah, oh, that's when I read a blog post. So there's going to be people out there like Laura that we don't reach. Mm. Yeah. So I don't think I've ever read my, it. Uh, reinforcing my idea that Planet Ubuntu isn't the right place for us to be doing announcements. Yeah. I wonder what. Um, to me, listeners. there's a lot of noise already. I wonder what our All listeners right. think about this. Yeah, um, you should email in or tweet us or dent us or maybe write a blog post about it and, and, and <laughs> put it out. Um, <laughs> you can email us at podcast at ubuntu dash uk dot org. It's time for the news. Are you interested in listening to or contributing to a weekly Debian podcast? That's the question being asked by Frostbite Systems, who sell computer hardware pre-installed with Linux distributions and have already started various podcasts, including This Week in Fedora, or TWIF. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps. I d- do you know what? I did a search for This Week in Ubuntu, and there doesn't seem to be any of This Week in Ubuntu. Ooh. Nobody's done that yet. There's, there's This Week in Linux. Yeah which some guy does a video podcast, which is quite fast. Um, and a, a Speed it up. Well, no, he, he talks very fast. Oh, right. <laughs> like, you know, not very many breaks. Um, but, yeah, this guy, um, Jonathan Nadal, I think it is, from Frostbite, okay. uh, has offered to do a Debian podcast. Yeah, this week in Debian. Yeah, they've got a wiki page about it where people suggest segment ideas or people do interviews, cool. that kind of stuff. Go mm-hmm. listen to Twid. Yeah. <laughs> WordPress themes should be released under the GPL version 2 license like WordPress itself. Premium theme thesis isn't, and this is a problem. Mm. Ooh, who said they should mm. be released under the GPL? The guy who started the WordPress project. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the what lead... would he know? <laughs> yeah, how and, dare he? And there's a blog post by the lead developer of the web platform, uh, WordPress.org, I think. Right, um, okay. And he's analysed in quite a lot of detail, but very well, um, why it is that you should basically you should that's quite interesting is, is that a case of if you publish your theme you should make it available well, people buy GPL? them people do do buy them but if you sat and made one yourself would that still be you it's, don't have to distribute that source because you're not distributing the source unless it's gpl v3 in which case you would have to blah, 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 blah. i don't know it's the php bit that you've got to yeah. provide that so you that's, can keep that's the theme any because, jpegs and yeah because the theme yeah. is in PHP. It's php and it's part of it is because when it loads it doesn't just load wordpress and then the themes completely separately it does wordpress themes wordpress yeah. themes blah, blah. Yeah, I can see so some, some of the code execution it's is just in part the of the code yeah right. yeah no i can see there's some logic there so mm. if you are making your theme available it has to be under gpl yep you still pay for it of course yeah. of course the rumored death of ubuntu with dell is greatly exaggerated says Anne camden the dell pr manager in fact dell are expanding their range of ubuntu offerings though it depends on the region as to what those offerings are the region being the usa 
Yeah, I think I think there's some in the UK as well. If you go to dell.co.uk slash Ubuntu, there's still the holding page there that says Ubuntu is getting better. It tells you <laughs> 10 <laughs> things about news. Ubuntu. Is it, uh, yeah, in reverse order now, aren't they? Yeah. For some reason. They were the other way up, I'm sure they were. Maybe it's leading up to a big climax because the last, the number one at the end says it comes preloaded with selected Dell desktop notebook and netbook computers. So maybe that's a lead in. Mm. So there, were yeah. st- there were stories that Dell were dropping Ubuntu as a, as a purchase option, hence yes. this mm-hmm. sort of rebuttal from Jerry Carr at Canonical and uh, the Dell, the Dell people as well. Yeah, I think that they didn't they say that the you can actually get them if you phone them up. Yes, it's so just not on the website. And, yeah, if you phone them up and choose them. Then you're able to choose a, uh, a configuration that you you know customize with the operating system of your choice. But it just doesn't you know it's not very nice when you go through the website and you customize it and the only options are Windows and every page you go to says we recommend Windows. Yeah. Yeah. I mean we're geeks. We don't want to talk to somebody on the phone. We want to do it on our website. Sure. <laughs> well, one of the problems I personally have with Dell is if you do speak to someone on the phone, they 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 put you under an awful lot of pressure these salespeople right. and they'll, they'll keep you know when are you going to make a decision I shall phone back at this time uh, and you know they, they really want to close the deal they really I mean they will offer you options you know throw in a printer or right. give you a memory upgrade or something like that but they're, they're quite aggressive about the way they sell they sell over the phone and that that can be off-putting and that's why it's very nice to have that you know screen between you and them and you can just browse the website and find your configuration do or you think, not do you think they try and be aggressive to steer you away to ubuntu away from ubuntu or towards it or? well we've we we did a little test a few of us in the ubuntu uk um, we didn't we didn't use the phone. Right. We used their online chat thing because okay. if you go to the website, there's a button that oh, says yeah. "Talk to a sales representative now." Mm-hmm. So, you know, the first question: "Hello, uh, how can I help you?" And we all asked roughly the same question: um, "I'm looking for a machine with Ubuntu," and the answer was, "No, we don't have any." Right. <laughs> so, you know that. that <laughs> That's a pretty big. So sphere. yeah, but so if I phone you up, are you going to give me a different answer? You know, what, yeah, how does that work? It's crazy. Chris Lamb has been working on a Debian Live Studio web application which allows users to create customised Debian CD and USB images. The source is open and Chris is looking for help with the project. Those interested should go to studio.debian.net. Is this like Ubuntu Studio? No. No. It is quite like SUSE Studio, I suspect. Yes. It is uh, an early early development version of uh, what SUSE Studio does. So, what does Suzu Studio? Do? I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, you go to Suzu Studio. It's a website. You, it, it's a service that lets you build custom ISO images. So, let's ah, say, for example, yeah. you wanted to have your own Suzu ISO image that that had your logo on it and had certain packages removed and other packages added. And a purple theme. Yeah, you could do just that. You, and it's all button clicking, so no commands. Oh. I know you like that. Yeah. So thanks. you just click through. <laughs> Pretty pictures. <laughs> yeah, pictures, icons and all that. Excellent. But the really nice thing about the Sousa one is you can, at the end, once it's built the ISO image or a USB stick image or um, a VMware ah, disk nice. image, mm-hmm. you can boot it up in the cloud and VNC to it in your browser window and actually log on to your desktop through the browser without actually downloading or burning any CDs or anything. Brilliant. It's quite cool. Clever. That's the SUSE one. That's the SUSE one. And so far, the Debian one is very early. I tried it out today, and you sign up, and then you go through a bunch of options, like what keyboard layout do you have, you know, locale, all that kind of stuff. Nice. What desktop environment do you want, KDE or no? And then it says, we'll send you an email when the ISO image is built. It's going to take a lot of server power, presumably, to produce all those different ISOs and generate all the disk images and I stuff. Guess, I guess disk space is going to be the premium well, yeah, one. that too. <laughs> you know, you could have a premium account and you know, mm-hmm. pay money. And Get it quicker. Mm. I haven't actually got the email yet telling me that my ISO image has been built and that was about <laughs> lunchtime earlier today. Well, it, <laughs> it's Debbie and only release it when it's ready. <laughs> <Oi>! <laughs> We've got three events to tell you about. The first one, Laura, is... The Geek Nick in Hyde Park, which is a picnic for geeks. Yes, coming up this Sunday. Yeah. Ooh, right, okay. Mm. Better get a move on then. Yeah, I hope the weather holds out. Yeah, so do I. Good luck. <laughs> oh, you're not coming. <laughs> I'm not I, I am there. there. I'm going with Claire and the children. 
Well, oh, yeah, it's a family event. The whole, uh, whole idea yeah. behind a geek nick is not sitting around with computers, although someone has said, I'll bring along a Wi Fi and share my wireless access. Fair. It's kind of meant to be a family thing where you sit around and, you know, eat picnic Talk. food and chat and, you know, Fair get enough. to know people cool. and that kind of stuff. Definitely not going. We're hopefully going hot. <laughs> <laughs> We're hopefully going hot. Tub, hopefully, yeah. yes. Daniel Holbach has announced the next Ubuntu Global Jam on the 27th to 29th of August. Mm. And a few teams have signed up already and uh, organising their own global jams. Good what stuff. happens? Uh, whatever you want to happen. Ooh. But hopefully in a uh, constructive, contr- yeah, constructive contributory manner towards Ubuntu Project. So that could be picking a package and going through all the bugs for that package, or it could be uh, picking a section of the wiki and up fixing the, the wiki documents, or it could oh, be yeah. translating, or it could be any kind, kind of, of contribution. Blitz of a whatever of a it is. Yeah, having a blitz focused, if you have a focused yeah. attention on one particular you know, project or, or application, then the idea is we can get a lot done. Um, with people, you know, sitting around a table. Um, I know the one for, that Laura's organising in in Ireland. Not mm. you, the other Laura. <laughs> you knew that. Though. Laura CZ Tab. Yeah, yeah Laura yeah. CZ Tab. Um, She's not going to like that. Think <laughs> Sorry, Laura. To, I think they're going to have um, uh, an online component so people can contribute via IRC. So cool. Can, Sounds good. Yeah, you know, keep everyone in sync who's not physically there. So teams just signing up specific ideas. Well, they're just signing up, and then they can pick and choose what they want to do themselves. And last but not least, we've got the UK Uni- UK <laughs> Unix Users Group, UK UUG, Open Tech 2010 on Saturday the 11th of September, um, which is in London, and it's only £5 on the door to get in, um, which is a, an informal one-day conference, um, that's a sort of slightly different approach to the typical formal conference, um, technology, politics, justice, sounds a little bit like um, OGCAMP. Yes. Perhaps. Um, there's a pic- uh, oh, I've just noticed there's a picture of Becky Hogg from there the Open Rights Group on the front page. So yes, that kind yes. of related stuff as well. Yeah, so it sounds like uh, that could be quite interesting actually. Saturday 11th of September. We wanted to talk about tablets, and I'm not talking about pharmaceuticals, I'm talking about... Well, I'm not sure, how would you describe a tablet? A sort of PC with no keyboard or is a that... big big phone with no <laughs> <laughs> with no microphone right okay yeah. in terms of an ipad so you think the ipad is quite a good example of a tablet or what a lot of people have seen in the press and stuff yes but they're not the only options are they there are a few other options you can they're you one can of get. the very few options mm. yeah i mean there's there's a few that have come out around about the same time there's one uh, called the juju Right. Which um, is is quite gargantuan compared to the iPad. It's quite big, but it's it's internally it's it's a PC. You know, it's a okay um, Atom CPU. You know, normal memory, that kind of stuff, storage. Right. But runs a strange, customized user interface. And then there's Android tablets that are around, and mm. then there's allegedly Windows Seven uh, tablet that was announced just today, um, called the Masterpad, Ooh. which sounds like a bit of a rubbish name to me, but runs Windows Seven. What about things like the N800, the Nokia N800? Is that a tablet? It's I don't a know. smartphone. Is it's it? Phone. I thought it was a mobile mm. internet device. Yeah. That's true. They're not phones because you can't really phone anybody on them. No. Well, you... the N900 can. Oh, okay. oh, yeah. That is a phone. Yes. But, but it also a has a touch screen and it has a keyboard. My phone has a touch screen. Does that make it a p- tablet? No. Well, you used to have a, a laptop, Alan, didn't you? That you yeah, that was more referred a... to as a tablet. Yeah, that was a convertible. So that was a PC <laughs> right, okay. that you turn the screen round and it turns into a tablet. Davey had one of those as well. Mm. And you write, write on it with a pen. If you had software it, it, that supported yeah. writing on Davey it with did. a pen. Yes. Yeah, there is, there is, there is a, a bit of software in Ubuntu uh, that, that does that. Yeah. Okay. So, so we, is there a place for these things? Well, that's that's the question, now we don't know what one it is. Yeah, now we, now we have roughly defined what one may or may not include. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's it. What's, what's the, uh, the, the appeal of them? Um, there's the commuter, the commuter uh, appeal, I guess. If you're sitting on a train, you can watch videos and stuff. But you could do that on a mobile phone. You could do it on a laptop. You could do it on a laptop. Yeah, it's true. But the thing, <laughs> but, yeah, but could, yeah, sorry. And now, now you can take your laptop to work and carry an iPad or a tablet as well, so you can watch the video. Well, it depends if you're the kind of person who needs to carry a laptop to work. Some people leave mm. their laptop at work. That's true. 
or desktop yeah. at work or whatever. So the only thing you carry around is you know this this iPad for the bits in between when you're at a computer. So you're at a computer at home, you're at a computer at work, and the bit in between, whether that's sitting on the sofa, on the toilet, or on the train, is the other device. Whatever that other device is, whether it's a, a full size tablet. When I say full size, like you know. <laughs> bigger than a few inches or yeah something. sort of a5 ish yeah. screen type tablet and there's the option of course you can still do your email and surf the web and and do perhaps non-intensive computing activities while you're on the move with it with an ipad you wouldn't want to try and type out you know an essay on it perhaps but you could you know you can do day-to-day tasks tweets and all that sort of stuff if that's what you're into yeah i remember seeing people saying that the ipad is a, and those kind of devices are all content consumption devices so you 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 okay. consume music video uh web content whether that's twitter and that kind mm. of stuff you consume your emails but people might not use it as a content creation device but it seems like people are using it as a content creation device you know you you could code on it you could um i don't know write blog posts you could write blog uh, art news articles you know whatever it is you do you could create on one of these things okay it might be slightly cumbersome might be a bit more difficult something to adapt to yeah but i didn't want to focus just on the ipad because there seem to be a load of these things out there i haven't seen any of this though okay well there's a few android ones kicking around um arcos have um a arcos 5 16 gigabyte internet tablet which runs android Ooh. Mm. so presumably you can get everything that's on the android store in the android wise. marketplace marketplace sorry yes. yeah get the terminology right um, but you know the same sort of range of apps, so you can do similar things to the things you might do on yeah. Apple. Similar equivalent. Similar, yeah. Okay. Uh, then there's the Dell Streak. Oh yes, which is a phone. Yes, is a big phone. It's a big, <laughs> <laughs> it's a big phone. Uh, yes, but it's st- it is a tablet, really. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's 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 small enough to fit in your pocket, whereas perhaps a, a, a tablet is big pocket. Yeah, <laughs> in my big coat, <laughs> especially big pockets. I mean the the thing that I've seen most people doing with with iPads is having them sort of almost you know, in place of a netbook, perhaps. Mm-hmm. So if they just want to check their email or or, or surf the web. Um, yeah, you know, while they're sat downstairs, they have a net. They have that instead of a netbook, just because they're not doing a lot of typing on it. And I can see that that might be really useful, actually, um, just because it's right. smaller and you know. I do the same thing on my phone. Okay, so my phone is is you know it's nowhere near the size of a tablet, and I can right. do email and um, mm. you know watch videos, listen to podcasts, play games, that kind of stuff. And you just scale that screen up a bit, yeah. it would just be a bit more usable. I think it's more cumbersome to mm. carry around, but it's a bit more usable. But then the question comes of software. Yes. Apple seems to have got this fairly right. Okay, there's the evilness of controlling their store and and the fact that it's all proprietary and it's very difficult to monkey around with it from a hacking point of view. But there's a lot of apps in there. There's a fair amount of apps and people are willing to buy them. Yes. And build them. Yeah, and build them. Yeah. Like, how much was that Formula One app? Oh, it's like 22 quid or something like that. 22 it's, pounds for an yeah. app that shows you statistics about the Formula One. Oh, it's more than just statistics. It shows you a little map of the racetrack, and you can see the cars go around it and, and in real time and stuff. Okay. It's really quite funky. And that's a great use of a, a device yeah. to have sat next to you while you're watching the Formula One on telly. Exactly, exactly. yes. Yeah. Or even if you're not watching yeah. on telly. <laughs> And I should imagine the appeal is slightly less if you're not watching the accompanying, <laughs> <laughs> the accompanying uh, visuals. Watching them go around the track. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so from a software point of view, it seems like the open source side, the free software side, with Android and um, whatever other platforms that there might be that are not Windows and OS ten. Yeah, we're kind of not there yet. It seems. It's like with my phone, I've got a Nokia phone and there are apps for it, but nothing like the numbers that you get for Android or iPhone. Mm. And when, let's say, the BBC writes an app or some you know, some provider writes them, you don't get them for... But are, are apps the, the, the killer thing that people would use it for? It is a device that has good email and good web uh, connectivity and, you know, a Twitter app or a microblogging app of some sort. Is that not enough for for a lot of people? I don't Do think so. Do they have to play Angry Birds or whatever? <laughs> well, nobody has to play Angry Birds. Once you've bought it, you You're feel compelled You're doing it now, to... I can see. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if you just look at the kind of apps that people use, there's, there's like, stuff to consume data like, you know, uh, e-reader 
yeah, apps e-book to reader, re- right? read books. Um, there's accessing your files when you're on the move, so something like Dropbox, being able to access the files that are at home, because these things don't have a huge amount of storage in them, so you mm-hmm. need some way of accessing stuff in the cloud. Right. Um, you- using tool, using apps to use websites like eBay more effectively and Amazon more effectively, okay. and that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I think you could get away with a tablet that was just very lean and just had a browser and that was it and you could probably get away with that but it would need to be really cheap to make it compelling Hmm. because you compare it with something like the ipad or something running android where you can install loads and loads of apps and you're right okay you haven't got a a value proposition there that that makes sense and you wouldn't get jake Humphreys holding it on national television like a fortnight before it's released yeah yeah he was quite he was quite, quite quick well with that. that. <laughs> That's probably where I've seen it used most is on the, is the Formula One coverage. Instead but of a clipboard. The, yeah. there, there was a recent article I saw, I think it was today actually, that said specifically comparing the iPhone and the iPad, Right. people who play the same apps or games on the iPhone and the iPad spend longer playing it on the iPad than they do on the iPhone. Hmm. So Interesting. So that says to me that people do use apps on these big format devices, whichever one they are. Mm. People yeah. want applications, and they're willing to sit there and engage with those applications on those devices. And they're a lot lighter than carrying a laptop around, so if you're taking it out of the house, it's not quite. It's not like carrying a laptop around with you. I don't know. Would people... Would you? Ta- okay, so you've got this Dream tablet, whatever platform mm. it runs, and it's light, and the battery lasts forever, and you've got all the apps that you need, all the things you use at the moment that are on your PC... Um, you could use on the move and it's got some magical connection to the internet wherever you are 3G. would you take it everywhere with you would you have brought it here with you today i probably would have today because i always bring my laptop so i can read the show notes mm-hmm. um so for that it would be a good one um i'd probably take it on the train if i'm going up north would you take it to like your parents house yeah. or something like that yeah. And sit and be unsociable on the sofa while they're yeah let's sit and being unsociable on their own laptops. Yeah, <laughs> we have a history. We have a history of taking several laptops with us. So adding oh, a, adding an iPad into the mix or something, a, a tablet of some sort, would not make that big a difference. No, in fact, my mum would spend her time trying to play on it. So. This is true. So, how are we served from a free software perspective then? Android. Yeah, is that? I mean, we we talked on about the um, on the Joggler trying to get uh, Ubuntu Netbook Edition to run on that and I think Laura you well, said it wasn't really designed for a, a touch screen interface not yet no. yeah not yet. yeah and that's where Android is be. designed from the ground up yeah to be used on a touch interface okay you can have a hardware keyboard like the the G1 right but every other phone basically except the, the a couple of Motorola ones don't have keyboards no so mm. it's designed from the ground up to be touch and we're not Ubuntu isn't yeah is there anything on the free software um, world well, android other than android well why do you want something other than android what's wrong with i android? i don't know i okay it's what people like choice don't they sure and it'd be interesting if, if other distributions like fedora or suza or whatever had, had really gone down that route and i wasn't aware of it well we recently saw um a, a news article that misinterpreted something someone at canonical said where they said something about there being a market for tablets and thought oh great that must mean canonical are developing a, an ubuntu tablet and then it turns out actually they're not. Mm. So you heard it if, here first. It, well, you heard it here last. Unfortunately, <laughs> it was it was a few weeks ago. But that makes me think if if Canonical aren't even thinking about doing it, or they're thinking about doing it very quietly and secretly with someone else, yeah. Yeah. then surely we should just focus on the ones that are doing it, like Android. Yeah, but you still can't get one. Still can't get one. What a, a, a tablet running. Android. Oh, you can. There are there are tablets out there. Okay. For example, there's one that I think was announced just today. Oh, uh, right. okay. You can get in the states. <laughs> oh, not. You say, oh, but there are, but there are. As if I might, as if this has been around for months, but it actually turns out it's just been released. Well, the today. Arcos <laughs> tablet has been around for a, <laughs> oh, okay. a while. The Dell Streak has been around for weeks. Yeah, I'm not. I, yeah, I, we can debate about whether Dell Streak is a proper tablet for a so while. I suspect. Is are they of the same kind of form factor as a as an iPad? So they you have that you, sleek niceness to them. If, <laughs> does anything have the sleek niceness of Apple products? <laughs> is that is that mm. the wrong thing to ask on a Ubuntu podcast? Well, it, yes, it, of course. Yeah, it is. it is. Of course, it is the wrong thing to ask, and we'll get emails. <laughs> but it's interesting since Apple came out with the uh, the Air. Mm-hmm. How many small, slim, mm. 
form factor laptops we've seen coming on the marketplace just a matter of and time. no other updated models of the macbook air yeah and and so you can run ubuntu on those pc based ones you i mean yes you can probably get ubuntu just about working on your air now but maybe you know it that they, they've sort of come up with a design concept that other people have then sort of tried to implement well, this was my point laura's, so we've all laura's, benefited. laura's question was asking if there are other devices that are as shiny as pretty as nice yeah. as the so iPad. as slim as well. As slim mm. and, you know, as lightweight and feel as nice. And it seems not. I mean, I haven't That's handled every single one. But from the ones I've seen, and you look at something like, you know, the Dell Streak, mm. it's, it's a really clunky, weird device. And it's, yeah. you know, there, there are things about it that are unattractive and, and don't feel bulletproof. And I can't see anything in any of the other tablets that actually make me think... Wow, that's pretty. That's yeah. what I'm and thinking. That's really disappointing. Yeah. But then nobody else spends so much on their design. True, true. And um, you you see the effect of that. But um yeah, no the whole thing I was saying before about just picking it up and taking it with me, going like on journeys, the size of it makes that attractive and, even. Yeah. Whereas something clunkier like a laptop, it's a bigger decision as to whether it's worth taking well, you're, it. You're, you're almost guaranteed, if you take a laptop, you're almost guaranteed you have to take a power supply with you. Yeah. yeah. And that's more weight to carry yeah. with you. Yeah. And you've got to get the seat at the window on the whereas train. Whereas a device that, that runs for you know, eight, ten hours or something and charges over USB, that's quite compelling. Hmm. Well, we asked uh, our followers um, on Twitter and Identica what they use a tablet for, or would they, or they would use one if they uh, if they found one that met their needs. And um, Dan Monsieurly says he would use a tablet for email, browsing, and social media networks, but he's just waiting for a decent Android or Ubuntu tablet at a reasonable price, mm-hmm. which is pretty much what we were saying before. Uh, Matt Bailey says similar. He'd uh, check his email, browse the web, read magazines, newspapers, and novels and stuff. Something like a Pixel QI display would be nice. Pixel Qi. Qi. It's, is that that's right? the same. It's a derivative of the, the display you get in the OLPC. Oh, okay. So it works in sunlight High and indoors. High contrast. Yeah, that sort of thing. Like Kindle. No, that's e-paper. The Pixel Qi one works outside and has a mode for outside the, and a different mode for inside. Yes. But the yeah, Kindle e-paper is, just is a the bit same. different. Um, and P. Taylor, I'm not, I guess, Paul or Peter or something like that, um, says his Phil. only... Yeah, oh, Phil, yeah, that <laughs> makes sense. It is Phil, sense. It is Phil yeah. isn't it? Yeah, sorry, Phil. Um, people should have more clear names on Twitter. <laughs> I, don't care. I was thinking this the other day. We should just click the links and actually read their names off their Twitter profile on the right. Yeah, but, you know... So effort. Um, he <laughs> says his his only tablet is an N eight hundred, but Mamo is just not viable. Android would be a much more modern and viable software option. Yeah, yeah, yeah it would more be more up to date apps. Well, there we go. By the time the next episode comes out, I'd like somebody to uh, send in an iPad for us to no, try. No, no, I was going to say make an iPad killer, uh, make something that's just as, as sleek and well manufactured that runs Android, and that they can then send us one and we'll review it. We'll get on that keep straight it. away. Yeah. You do that, right? <laughs> Double the trouble this week. Alan has two command line loves to share with us. What are they? First one is one we've actually mentioned before, and it's one I can actually read out okay. without worrying about, well, possibly... Syntax, space, syntax highlight, that kind of yeah. Stuff. Yeah. give it a go. Um, the command is do-release-upgrade. Okay, and what does that do? It allows you to upgrade your system from one release of Ubuntu to the next release. Okay. So, Why for example... Uh, sorry, why, say, would why would I use that rather than clicking on the update thing when it tells me there's a new distribution release ready? Well, if you like the command line, you might do it. Or if you're running on a server that doesn't have a GUI, uh-huh. you might do it. Uh-huh. 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 Fair enough. And I've used this to upgrade my server in London, my virtual server, and it worked fairly okay. I went from 8.04 to 10.04. Okay. From LTS to LTS. LTS to LTS. And that, that, worked, well. that worked well. worked well. Okay, good. But yeah, you can also use it to go from one you know, release to another. I've I've used it a fair bit actually. Normally even for graphical systems or systems with a with a GUI on because mm-hmm. I can't be bothered to go and sit at the computer for, to watch the whole upgrade process go by. So I um, do it from another room. Um <laughs> and apart from having to edit one config file to tell it to use a local mirror, mirror right. um it's great. Yeah, very happy with that. How's it different from using apt? Ah, it, it, it it has um it's got some cleverness. Quirks. Because, Good quirks? Yeah, because sometimes upgrades break. And, <laughs> no. yeah, I know. Who'd have thunk <laughs> Who it? Who'd have thunk it? 
So they build quirks into update manager okay. and do release upgrade to cope with uh, those quirks, which is why we recommend you use those rather than just editing the sources file and doing an app get dist upgrade. Right. That's the theory. Yeah, and it offers you some options and things as well as you go through. It's, although it's largely unattended. Yeah. It's pretty good. What's your second one then, Alan? The second one I actually saw today on um, where we sometimes get these command line loves from, which is commandlinefoo.com. Oh, yes. Which is great. And they link to us. So they are our good, our good yeah. friends. Well, they are good friends because every single um, command that's listed, they link back to the podcast. Yeah. Which is nice. We should link to them. We should, and I will do. We pin them on the one. show. There you go. Yes, we do. Because they're lovely people. They are. So this one, eventually we'll yep. get to it. Yeah, go for it. It's a really simple one. Okay. Reset. Right, okay. That's the command. That's it. What? Reset. What does it reset? Your terminal. So in the event that you've messed it up, say, for example, you accidentally catted a binary file and the prompt is all screwy and it, you get garbage all over the screen, you just type reset and it goes junk and clears the screen and makes it all nice and reset. It's Who lovely. would ever do something as silly as that? Like CLS used to do. It also shrinks the window width down to 80 characters. I was on a Windows box and I tried it earlier today using putty yeah. SSH to um, a remote server and I just typed reset and as soon as I did Ooh. that the window went junk and shrunk down to 80 characters wide. Yeah. Now I, I must admit I did know the reset would reset your character encoding if you cat a binary but I didn't know it did the reset terminal width thing. I'm going to yeah, try I, that. I was, I was somewhat surprised actually. Yeah, well, that's, that's but good. I thought mm, that must be doing something good. <laughs> it's always good to find a way out of a hole you have got yourself into. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. Yes, because sometimes you've got something on the screen and you want to, you know, reset. There you go, reset. Excellent. It's time for Gerald. No, it's not. Oh. What is it, Laura? Bit about Ubuntu. Okay, what's in the bit? Uh, Amber Grainer says that the Ubuntu news team needs you. Yes, you. Me. <laughs> Me? <laughs> well, you know, anyone who wants to help out. Is there a bit of Lord Kitchener pointing going on? It, yeah. There is, yes. Uh, so the news team create the Ubuntu Weekly News, which is a uh, text. Um, Email, isn't it? It is. Uh, and they do that every week. And they have done every week for 200 plus weeks. Wow. And, it's uh, pretty long yeah. as well, isn't it? It's pretty lengthy, yeah. And, and they need a bit of help. And Amber's the editor now? Yes. Yeah, there's been um, a few editors uh, in the time, but uh, Amber's doing it now. And, um, yeah, she needs some help collating stats, gathering blog posts, getting news, filtering it, uh, a bit of copy editing, that kind of stuff. It's all f- pretty straightforward stuff, but it's a little bit time-consuming. So, um, yeah, give her some help. So where can people find out more? There'll be a link in the show notes. Or oh, we'll let out. <laughs> The location and dates for the Ubuntu Developer Summit, the next one, have been announced, and they are... It's on the 28th of October, and it's in Orlando in Florida. It's not just on the 28th of October, is it? No, it starts. It starts starts for five days. Yes. Okay, excellent. Well, that's very nice for those who get to go. Mm. It's very sunny, I'm sure. Nice place to go in Florida. A bit different from a hotel in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, exactly. Sea World <laughs> yeah, and Hotel in the middle of Florida. <laughs> <laughs> well, arguably. Um, uh, the Epcot Centre and all that sort of stuff there. Yep. Yeah, I, I don't there. know if there'll be time to go and well, play at Disney. It's, yeah, It'll be an it's, evening. It's not quite like busy. it's work, is it? Huh? <laughs> Can't say that. That's not, I, well, yeah, I can. My wife won't let me go. Okay. <laughs> Dell have released Open Manage for Ubuntu. Now, this is quite interesting. Is it? Open Manage is Dell's uh, server hardware management tool which you can install optionally on Dell servers that allows you to... It's a web-based thing and allows you to manage things like RAID arrays and check the health of hardware and oh, stuff like really? that. really? Yes. I think they have had a, a Linux version for a, a while, but, you know, a bit clunky and perhaps not up to speed. So it's good to see Ubuntu, uh, uh, almost certainly RPM-based, the old one, uh, good to see Ubuntu kind of coming online with that because if you've got a lot of Dell servers, it's a really useful tool for managing your, your hardware stock. Wow. Yes. So, you know, give that a go. Um, apparently they're natively compiled for 9.10, though, so we're a little bit behind the uh, the release curve, but hopefully they'll catch up. Canonical are bundling IBM's DB2 Express and Ubuntu for cloud trials, which just sounds quite cool. So Do people pra- use DB2? I believe so. Quite well, presumably. DB2's, so we've mentioned this before, it's certified for use on Ubuntu now, it isn't is. it? Yeah, and the Express yeah. version is sort of like the light version, if you like. 
what yeah. database up to one megabyte in size. <laughs> <laughs> and he does three kind of column types and stuff. <laughs> I think the idea is that um, enterprise developers can test their um, applications on it directly to see if it runs okay. I guess for porting to Ubuntu. Mm. It certainly makes life a lot easier from a licensing point of view. Um, if you are trying to do stuff in the cloud, you, you can just commission an image which has got it all there set up rather oh, than okay. having to commission you don't have the image to and then do a post install and, and stuff. license a bazillion uh, CPUs for your Oracle license yeah, or whatever. Yeah, exactly. It gets you around those tricky, tricky little problems. The Canonical design team have set out a specification and a deadline for getting a new sound theme in Ubuntu. Yeah, to replace the uh, conga thing that I conga. Uh, what is it the called? The um, umbongo drums. The umbongo or drums. Call it. Uh, is that the one that Pete Has it got did? a name? Yeah. Do you really? remember when we interviewed Pete Savage, he told us what it was actually properly called. Pete Savage was the guy who made it in the in the yeah. first place. It was named after the version, the release it came out in. I can't remember what it was called. Did Pete say that it's been edited down each release because the startup time they gets have, smaller? Yeah. Well, they've oh, really? dropped the, the shutdown sound. <laughs> that was dropped a long time ago. Because oh, yeah. we used to yeah. it used to play a sound, and then the sound driver would be lopped off, and the sound would cut out. It did come on at work the other day, actually, when I, I logged into my Ubuntu laptop, and they said, "Does it do that every time you turn it on?" <laughs> I was like, well, Windows makes a bingy bongy yeah, bong and noise. Apple that Macs do as well. They go boom. <laughs> <laughs> they do make it kind of like brain dead bong. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna find out what it was called. Well, the uh, the interesting thing about this is um, there's. There's not a huge amount of time left to contribute to this. Um, we'll put a link to the, the blog post from the design team. And they want your entries in by the 28th of August. And the keen amongst you will notice that Maverick releases on the 10th... Uh, sorry. It's the 28th of October. And the keen amongst you will notice that it uh, is after Maverick releases on the 10th of October. Oh, so, so this must be for... Um, yeah, the next Maverick release. plus one. Yeah, yeah 1104. Oh. Hmm. So we're not mm. going to have a new sound theme for this release. Well, mm. okay. Oh. How many bars can it be? Because everything's got to... S- if the start-up time is getting shorter and shorter. Yeah, it'd just be, well, it'd be like the Mac. Bong. <laughs> Maybe they'd have gone, bing. <laughs> well, you would hope so. You'd hope it's going to be pretty quick, you know. You don't really want a concerto playing. No. And then when it finishes, you can use your computer. You want... Maybe bong, it's ready. It should carry on. Like yeah. a bit of, like lifting music Hidden. in the background. Ooh. Upliftings cool you down and calm you down and Laura ease you into the yeah don't sing <laughs> <laughs> and it's time for the feedback you may remember uh, a few weeks ago I mentioned that I thought more people bought apps on iPhones than did on Android yes well there was a report that suggested that so it wasn't just you was it uh, well yeah but I believe that given yes. that I had an Android phone and I bought one app and I now have an iPhone and I've bought more than one app. Based on that scientific sample of one person. Yes, 100% yes. of the Self-selected people that I sample. asked yeah. have done that. Um, and we had a bit of contact from um, Mr. Ben, yep, who's uh, asked me what Android phone I got from Orange because his desire came with the Orange App Store pre-installed. Uh, and we- the answer was? Uh, I had an HTC Hero, which didn't. Uh. have the Orange. And I think what he's suggesting is that this kind of uh, dilutes those stats because people buy apps from different places so if you buy a new phone it's possible you won't use the android marketplace but actually you'll use orange's app shop or whatever network you're on's app app so going back to your uh sample um how many app stores did you buy from well on the iphone i can only buy from one (laughs) on the android (laughs) and on android i did i did only buy from one there there are multiples as mr ben says but i only bought from one he also says that the Android marketplace doesn't support some countries. Yeah. So people have to get it from a third-party uh, site right? in the, any of those countries. I'm not sure which ones they are. He doesn't say that. Fair enough. Russ Phillips emailed in to say... Just been listening to your segment about advocacy in the wider community. Some years back, Jen, my wife, and I helped a local scope group do their computing badge. We provided several computers running Linux, which they used to do the various tasks. And afterwards, we gave them all copies of the OpenCD, which is a collection of open source Windows software with a nice front end. The whole thing generally went down quite well, and some of the adult helpers seemed interested in Linux, but one kid refused to take a CD in case any of the software had a virus. We weren't entirely sure what to do about that. We were prepared to deal with questions about legality of copying, etc., but it might have a virus really took us by surprise. 
Mm. I guess that's fair, you know. Yeah. It shows actually that they've been listening to the advice. Yeah, don't take CDs from them. strangers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Stranger danger. Yeah. <laughs> and the fact that it might have a virus on or whatever. I mean, when we were giving CDs out in um, um, Software Freedom Day in London, yeah, um, people were quite reluctant. Mm. You know, you say free CD, free software, and hey, they yeah, walk past is it not you. just quite weird in the street to be? I think, I think so. Yes. Uh, yeah, probably it wasn't so much the viruses, more the uh, weirdos <laughs> with orange T-shirts on trying to thrust Ubuntu CDs in their hands. Yeah, enough to put me off. Ian Pascoe emailed in to suggest a good location to pimp Ubuntu. I would suggest the good old county shows. Who are? <laughs> yes, I know that the image that is conjured up straight away is a lot of farmers and their animals parading around for the benefit of judges and so on. Um, but it's not just that these days, now that the shows have, uh, have diversified. Firstly, you have a large cross-section of audience, ranging from the school or senior citizen outing to chief executives out for a day with their daughter who's riding in one of the competitions. Next, there is normally a wide group of stallholders and exhibitors on site, so something like an Ubuntu-oriented stand wouldn't be out of place. Maybe Canonical would want to sponsor such an event. Yeah, Alan Bell actually looked into this um, uh-huh. at a couple of um, county shows, and they are quite expensive to have a stand at. Right. Even just like a trestle table and a bit of space is, you know, Roughly hundreds, hundreds, of pounds. hundreds of pounds. I think yeah. it was 600 and, 600 and something pounds for a Surrey uh, Surrey one. I think it was Surrey. And I guess a lot of people who go to those sort of things are there. They're selling some sort of produce, so they stand a chance of making some of that money back. Mm. We're not sure how much they're back. You have to be <laughs> well, very yeah, maybe high quality. Selling cupcakes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lemonade stand cupcakes. might uh, might have a bit of trouble making yeah. that revenue back. But I guess they're they're at least you know revenue making of some sort, whereas an Ubuntu stand wouldn't be revenue generating. Well, arguably that's why Canonical should sponsor it because they can make revenue back through services and yeah, yeah it's okay. marketing. Yeah, yeah, mm. we should contact Canonical about that. But Maybe on a, they'll listen to this on a smaller scale. There might be more local fairs and, and things that are perhaps. Yeah, cheaper I was to thinking more uh, village fates as we talked yes. about in the last episode. Mm-hmm. Yes, and they have lots of cake on those as well, so it yeah. is a win-win situation. Last episode, we mentioned an article which suggested that native English speakers have an advantage in the Ubuntu community. Burned emailed in to say. I can understand the problem for non-native speaking people because I'm from Austria and it's hard for me to read and write in English. But the benefit of trying to contribute and reading blog posts or listening to podcasts in other languages is that I'm able to improve my skills in those languages. After a few years, it's easier for me to write feedback in English and I hope my English isn't that bad. It's excellent. If Perfect. <laughs> that email is uh, anything to go by. But that's a bit of a one-way street, isn't it? He's, he's gaining... Um, through you know well actually it's two way really because he gains the uh, language skills and then also gains the ability to contribute back and Mm -hmm. i guess we gain in in terms of his contribution in the future yeah we just don't learn anything but english that's the problem (laughs) that's the downside yeah chris k emailed in to say I've been a bootleg Photoshop user in my pauper state, but I want to legitimise my operation by getting into the GIMP for for photographic retouch and image manipulations. I've been using 64-bit version of Lucid to test the waters, and to be frank, I'm having a hell of a time getting my Wacom Graphite 4 working on the dual screen setup I've got going on. GIMP, MyPaint and Inkscape work, but pressure sensitivity and cursor positioning on the graphics tablet is screwed. Even in the excellent Wacom control panel has failed me. The Ubuntu forums are a mess of contradicting advice for each release, so much so that I'm seriously considering going back to Vista for my design projects. I've had a quick look at Open Artist, but to be honest, it looks like early days and unpolished to me, judging from the website. Would it be pleasing for you to spend a little podcast time examining the pros for startup artists using Ubuntu as an operating system? I need more motivating. Well, there you go. Um, you you the- use a Wacom, don't you? I do, yes, and it does work, and that the pressure sensitivity and things work as well. So um, it is possible to get it, get it working. But I remember that a couple of releases ago, it was turned off by default. I think. Oh yes, that was yeah in the in the transition to the Xorg, the auto detects your input devices. Right. There was it, Wacom was off by default, and then you had to manually configure it. And I think that's where all this contradicting advice you see all over the place is. is right. You know, there's pages that tell you how to configure it if you're on this version or that version of Ubuntu, and that 
that can be frustrating for someone who's new and not realising what's right and wrong. Yeah, I, mean, I haven't done the clean install to find out if it now just works out of the box or whether there is a, a, a tick box or something to, to select to make it happen. But uh, I do know that it can work and it does seem to work well for me. One of the things he talks about is the dual screen thing, which is a little bit of a problem because the... Um, the tablet I have is a sort of standard resolution, not a widescreen resolution. Um, oh, the aspect ratio. Aspect ratio, oh, yeah. right. But also, if you've got dual heads, effectively, it's twice the width of a standard screen. Oh. Um, but, of course, it tries to map that onto a standard width resolution. So, Ooh. you have so to... So, do you have, like, a dead zone top and bottom? Or you no. Or re- region Just you can't really reach fast. on the left and right? <laughs> it means that, that if you move... Uh, one inch to the side it moves twice as far across the screen as it does if you move one inch down on your tablet uh, right so there's a bit of so kind of you've got to get used to it a little bit. it's not difficult to get used to but if you're I, I haven't done a lot of painting and and sort of that sort of thing where i might train my hand to do that sort of thing with a much finer right. degree of precision mm. um yeah. So yes, there's a few little quirks and things to to work out there, but I don't know whether they work them out different on an, any other platform. Mm. But yeah, I mean, yeah, there's the Ubuntu Studio project, which is supposed to sort of do well. It has been in the past Ubuntu Studio project, but that's kind of fallen by the wayside now. But they were supposed to kind of um, do that sort of artistic uh, artistic stuff, stuff out of the but box. It's still built on the same apps. It's still yeah, the same version of true. Xorg, the same drivers. You know, there's only yeah. so much they can do. I think. Yeah, I mean, it, he sort of says that he's looking for a bit of encouragement. Well, I can encourage you to continue. Um, I'm not sure I can, can encourage anybody in particular resources. I mean, I, I use GIMP and FSpot and UF Raw for processing my photos and stuff. So it can be done. Ton is an example of being motivated to keep trying with all the video programs you've used. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's true. I've done the video editing on, on Linux as well, and I, I've got, yeah, there's a working solution now that, that or two. It took a while there's, to get there. Though, there's also yeah. the, the, the thought that you shouldn't necessarily beat yourself up too much about it if that particular thing that you really want to do doesn't work yet. Yeah. File a bug, monitor the bug, keep an eye on it, dual boot, go back to Windows, use Windows if that's the only platform that works for you. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's. I know it sounds bad. Yeah, you know, suggesting users should use Windows, but it's it's no different than suggesting someone use a binary driver if they want to use three D or mm. you know there's there's levels of extreme and you know switching back and dual booting when you know when something doesn't work is about as much as you can do really. And a nice little arc. One of my readers at the Human Library um, was a musician and he tried using Ubuntu, um, and he had the same kind of problems and had gone back to Mac. Yeah. Cool. Well, let us know how you. Uh how you get around those problems if you can do Mark Erickson emailed to add to the debate about child safety online to say I find that there are two real problems uh, blocking unsafe websites and material for which I recommend OpenDNS and the other is enabling kids to get easily get to their own web safe websites for that I've created a website to help kids find the good content so they don't channel surf the web you can check it out. Um, it's called Kanga Place at kangaplace.com. And the idea is that you as the parent create a pouch and you choose the Kids Safe reviewed uh, website links to put in the pouch and you make the pouch easy for your kids to get to, like a homepage or a prominent link. And then they can easily visit tons of cool, fun and educational websites without needing to type or mistype addresses or names. That's quite a good idea. It's like a little walled garden approach, I guess. Yeah. With browsers, though... They can just smack buttons in the address bar and yep. <laughs> randomly surf off anywhere. Yep, true. So unless you're prepared to lock down your uh, thing into a console mode, <laughs> you could well, do. Yeah. And we've had quite a few people recommend OpenDNS as a way of um, blocking That does seem stuff. to be the way to go, doesn't yeah. it, really? There's a moth on my computer now. <laughs> we are sitting in the dark. Yes. That's time to finish the feedback, I think. <laughs> Thanks for listening, and you can find out how to get in touch with us on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org, where you can find out our IRC channels, Twitter, Identica, voicemail, all that sort of stuff, and a new feature that Alan will link to in the show notes, he says. I will, with the unfeasibly long URL that I won't read out. Yes, which is an etherpad where you can drop drop, uh, suggestions and things in. Mm -hmm. Um, If there's stuff you'd like to see us do in the show and you can't be bothered to email us, you can click on that link and just drop it in there and see what other people have put in there, which is always good. Bash your face on the keyboard until something comes out. Yes. Um, 
thanks. And um, hopefully we'll bounce some ideas off each other and maybe, uh, you know, uh, come up with some interesting new concepts. We did actually use them this time, didn't we? Yeah, I think we've had a couple in there. So let us know what you think of the show. Um, give us your thoughts about Ubuntu and the community around it. That's all for this time. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. Thank you. See you next Bye. time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.